6G, what is that? Why do we need it? And how is it created? These are questions that I will answer in this video. So 6G is a future technology for cellular networks or mobile communication networks. And these are the networks that are already being used for a long time, where we have mobile phones or other connected devices that connects to base stations or cell towers located at different places in our world. And each of these cell towers is serving a particular area that we call a cell. That's why it's called cellular networks. And the important thing for these networks is that they should cover large areas. So here is an illustration of Sweden and which areas we provide coverage with different generations of the cellular technology. So that is sort of the basic kind of thing. Where can we reach the base stations with our devices? But even more important today, what performance can we deliver at different locations? That is important both in terms of bits per second, in terms of latency and other performance metrics. We have passed through a number of different generations of this cellular technology, starting with 1G in the 80s, and then we have had roughly one generation per decade. So 2G, the second generation in the 90s, then 3G, then 4G, then now we have 5G in this decade, and we can predict that 6G will start to be deployed in 2030 and be a technology being evolved in that decade. Apart from changing the technology as such, what we are using technology has also been increasing over the years. So we, of course, can still make phone calls and that was the original service, but we have also added already from the 2G era messaging and that we can have a global roaming to use the same technology all over the world using the same devices. So that is also why we, it's important to have a global standard for these type of technologies. Then we started with some low speed data transfer. And in the beginning, that was the only thing you can do with your mobile phone in terms of data transfer. But it's also been used for telemetry. So your car, for example, can send a message if there is an accident. Then mobile broadband started in the late 3G era and has then become very important. And nowadays we are streaming a lot of things like a video. Then fixed wireless access became an alternative to fiber connection, for example, because it was fast enough and can be delivered in a cheaper way in certain regions of the world. And that started already in the 4G era. Massive Internet of Things to so connecting a lot of small devices in an energy efficient manner using the cellular network technology. That was also something that was added in the 4G and then also in the 5G. So 5G era has, of course, improved on these technologies. In the 5G era, we added critical communication. So all of a sudden, law enforcement, for example, can rely on this technology or also different kind of things like self-driving vehicles could potentially be implemented because we can deliver messages with high reliability and low latency and guarantee that. And of course, something else will be added in the future. For example, in the 6G technology, will support new applications that we haven't really imagined yet. But a general thing when it comes to this network evolution is that we started with having one network per applications. So we can only do phone calls with our mobile phones. And we had another technology for radio broadcasting to listen to FM radio in your car or in your home, and also for TV broadcasting. Then now all of these things can be done within one network, connecting to the internet over wireless technology. But that is not the end, one network for everything. No, with 5G, we create something called network slicing, where the same network can adapt its characteristics for different kinds of devices. So of course, we can deliver high speed in the best effort manner to smartphones, for example. But critical applications like law enforcement, then the network can behave in a different way in order to guarantee the kind of services that they're having. And then we might have to reduce the speed a little bit in order to achieve that. And to deliver Internet of Things applications, well, then these devices will only have a small amount of data to transfer, but they want to do it in a very energy efficient manner so the battery life can be long. In many parts of the world, we have still only deployed the first slice here for mobile broadband with high speed. But we will see over the next few years how the additional slices have been added to network and new business cases are arising. So with this in mind, why do we need 6G when 5G is still evolving? Well, the traffic demand in our cellular networks is increasing all the time. It's doubling every four years 
roughly at the same pace as the increase of data traffic on the internet is happening. So for this reason, we can see that most of the traffic is still carried by 2D, 4G and 3D networks, but we will see how most of the new generated traffic will be carried by the 5D networks. And when that technology can't handle more traffic, we will need a new generation. In addition to that, there are also new applications happening. One of them is, of course, that we will have all of the applications I described before, but with higher performance requirement by the users, and that requires more data. Then we will see how the industry and our society becomes more and more automated and what we call digitalization, and that will create more traffic and more demands of different kinds of slices for supporting that automation. Brain-computer interfaces is something that might happen, so your brain will be connected somehow. Self-driving vehicles haven't taken off yet, and technology will require very specific performance requirements. And artificial intelligence over these networks will be something that becomes very important to upload data in order to train new networks and make decisions, and that is part of making our society smart. Global coverage is another important application for 6G. Today we only have great connectivity in certain parts of the world and we would like to make sure that connectivity is something that we have all around the globe, even at sea and in rural areas, and both in improvement of the cellular technology as such and integration with satellite communications will be important to achieve that. Extended reality is another emerging application with the Apple Vision Pro being one example of this. And if that technology takes off and people start walking around and mixing the digital and the real world, well, that will require immense data rate and also coverage everywhere for this to make sense. And finally, we are today using a different technology for radar sensing and localization than we use for wireless communications. But these are features that can be also added into the networks in order to uh, measure if there are vehicles moving around or what is the speed and other kind of things that create new applications that we haven't really envisioned yet. And this is only the beginning of the speculations on new application areas that the SIG technology could support. But of course, they cannot be implemented until we actually have 60 networks deployed all over the world. So these are still futuristic applications. Looking at what happens now, there are three main key players in the 6G development. The first one is the ITU, or the International Telecommunication Union, which is setting the requirements for something to be called 6G. And of course, they are monitoring the stakeholders that might use this technology in the future to figure out what are the requirements that they are seeking for this application that I was describing. Then the specifications for the technology is created by 3GPP, the third generation partnership project, which was created to create global standards for 3G and then they continue doing that for 4G and 5G. So they will create the specifications and then the different technology components that will be used in 6G is something that the global research community, both companies and academia have created together and they will then have to be specified as part of the technology of 6G. So to go into more details, we are now in 2024 and over the past five years or so, there have been intense research, both in academia and industry, into different enabling technologies. Things that can be added as new features into 5G to make a 6G and hopefully achieve better performance and achieve requirements. And that research is now coming towards an end and it's time to somehow bring it into a 6G technology that can be deployed around 2029 and start to be used commercially in 2030, and then start developing all of the services and applications that builds around 6G. In order to get there, ITU is doing the following things. So last year, they had a World Radio Communication Conference in December 23, when there were discussions about what frequency bands could be utilized for 6G that is not utilized for 5G today. And they are also working on the performance requirements under the name IMT2030. And that stands for International Mobile Telecommunications. So this is a term that they have been using for a long time for cellular communications. And over these years here, until the end of 2025, they will come up with the actual requirements for technology to be called 6G. And then 
in 2027 and 2028, different organizations can submit technical proposals for something to be evaluated and later being confirmed to be called 60. And we can expect that 3DPP will be the only ones actually submitting a proposal. In the end of 27, there will be a new World Radio Communication Conference, and that is the opportunity to decide on that specific bands can be used for 6G. So in 23, they identify some bands, and in 27, they have the opportunity to decide on it. And in the meantime, they will be analyzing what will be the consequences of using particular bands in terms of coexisting with other kinds of wireless technologies. So when it comes to 3DPP, what are they doing? Well, now in this year, they're starting to work on something called Release 19. So they are creating different releases of the cell technologies every one to two years. And that is the first one where they will be working on 5G technologies. And they will do it also in Release 20 and then in Release 21. And that will then lead towards the end of 2028 to the actual proposal being sent to IDU. The process in 3DPP works like this. So first, you can look into a number of different things in what is called study items. So that is when you are looking into different enabling technologies and other suggested changes, and you study it at the surface to figure out, is there something there or not? Will there be enough interest from the industry to actually go into detail on specific things? And when they decide to do that, they create work items where you identify all the things that has to be standardized in order to actually put it into standard. And after that, you make the detailed technical specifications so that when you follow the standard, different devices and telecommunication infrastructure can actually talk to each other and you guarantee that there is interoperability in these networks. Release 21 is only the beginning of 6G. So 3DPP will continue with new releases and make enhancements to technology. And this is what happens all the time. 5G today is not the same as the 5G that was first deployed because new features are added all the time. And that will continue over the next decade. So when it comes to then this IMT 2030 scenarios or requirements that IDU is creating, we don't have all the details yet, but this is what we know. So in terms of usage scenarios, before in 5G, we had three categories representing three specific slices. So there is the enhanced mobile broadband that we have today, the massive machine type communications, which is for internet of things, and the ultra reliable low latency communications that is meant for critical communications. These are the, the edges of a triangle and the improvements of these things with higher requirements will get new names. Immersive communication for mobile broadband, hyper-reliable and low-latency communications for the ultra-reliable case, and massive communications for massive Internet of Things. In addition to improving the existing free scenarios, there are also free new usage scenarios. The first one is integrated sensing communications, where the cellular network will not only be used for communications, but also for radar sensing and new applications around that. Then there is AI and communications, which can mean two things. One is to change the standard so that we can learn things about the propagation environment and make the protocols in the communications and sensing work better thanks to AI. But it's also about enabling AI happening at other places and sending different kinds of model updates that are required to train AI models. And finally, there is the ubiquitous connectivity, which is really about connecting the unconnected and making sure that we have good connectivity all around the globe. The IMT 2030 requirements will be created to enable these usage scenarios. And it will contain a number of different capabilities. Some of them are the green ones here, which are the same as we had before, but with larger and tougher requirements. And then there will be a number of new capabilities that were not there in 5G at all. When it comes to the existing capabilities, it's the peak data rate. We will have numbers on how fast it can go in the networks in the best case, but also the typical use experience data rates. Something called the spectrum efficiency, which tells us how much data we can transfer per hertz of bandwidth. The area traffic capacity, so how much traffic can we actually handle in our networks. How many devices can be connected at the same time per square kilometer. What is the highest speed that the user can move while still being connected to the network. What is the latency? 
that the data have, so the delay between the request to when the data is delivered. What is the reliability in decoding data correctly and not having to ask for a repetition of something that is sent? And then there will be measurable targets for security and resilience. When it comes to new capabilities, there will be targets on coverage, on sensing related capabilities related to integrated sensing and communications, uh, applicable AI related capabilities, whatever that might be, sustainability, interoperability, so that not only mobile phones and infrastructure and talk to each other, but you can also build your seller networks using different infrastructure components from different companies, which is a rather new thing also called Open RAM. And finally, positioning in terms of using radio signals to detect where a device is. That is also something that there will be capability targets for. Finally, 6G spectrum. What are the frequency ranges where 6G will be utilized? Well, we can look at where we are using the technology today. 2G, 3G and 4G are typically down between 600 megahertz up to 2, 2.5 gigahertz. 5G were then designed for two new bands, one around 3 gigahertz up to 7 and one called millimeter wave from 24 and up to say 75 gigahertz. And based on this, we can see that there are some wide spaces both in between the two 5G bands and also above in what is known sub terahertz or terahertz. But what we actually know is that the new bands that will be considered for 6G on the next World Radio Communication Conference are around 4.6, 7.8 and 15 gigahertz. So it is typical in this range here between the two 5G bands where the new spectrum will be. However, we can still use all of the spectrum that was allocated for 4G and 5G also in 6G. So we can say that it is particularly in all of these frequency ranges here where the 6G technology might be deployed, depending on the operator's choice. And what are those choices based on? Well, at lower frequencies, we typically have better coverage, so the signals are propagating further. However, at higher frequencies, we typically get better speed, better precision in sensing and localization, and therefore, there is always trade-offs here, and that is why you deploy base station of different kinds. And when we look at the new frequency bands that 6G might get access to, we can deploy a new network without having to tear down something that were not already existing. Well, the 7.8 gigahertz band seems to be a golden band, somewhere here in between, with rather good coverage, but also higher speed than in the 5G networks of today, which are predominantly deployed in the 3.5 gigahertz band. So we can have still good coverage and higher speeds if we're operating in these bands. So to wrap up, 6G will be the next generation cell technology being deployed in 2030 and then used throughout the next decade. It will be a network deployed in many different frequency bands, used for many different things and having many different characteristics in different scenarios. And there is a large number of performance targets that the technology will have to achieve and be better than 5G and all of those things. And one network for all applications, both the ones that we can imagine today and the kind of applications that might arise during the next decade. Thank you for watching this video all the way to the end. If you would like to understand the 6G candidate technologies in further details, there are many other videos like this one on this YouTube channel.